Meditation Practices in Tibetan and Chinese Chan Manuscripts from Dunhuang by Sam Van Skyk. The Dunhuang Manuscripts were discovered at the beginning of the 20th century, having been sealed away some 900 years earlier at the beginning of the 11th. There were thousands of manuscripts in the cave, many of which belonged to individual Buddhist monks and monastic officials. A small but significant group of them deal with the masters and teachings of early Chan, and it's fair to say that these manuscripts revolutionized people's understanding of the early history of Chan Buddhism. In the book Tibetan Zen, I argued for understanding the Tibetan Chan texts as embedded in the manuscripts. By this, I meant not just treating the manuscripts as carriers of the texts, to be discarded as soon as the text is transcribed and translated, but to see the manuscripts as the most important thing, the physical embodiment without which there would be no text, this principle is, I believe, equally relevant to the Chinese Chan texts. The manuscripts can tell us who thought the text was important and what they did with it. In other words, these physical objects allow us some access to the people and practices that give the text life and meaning. The Dunhuang manuscripts represent the earliest major collection of Chan texts and offer us an opportunity to understand the social and practical setting of early Chan practice. But this can only work if we look at the Dunhuang manuscript materials as a whole. Too narrow a focus on specific texts can lead to mistaken conclusions, and this includes bracketing out the manuscripts that don't contain Chan texts. What we're looking at with the manuscripts from the Dunhuang cave is the remnants of a community, and what these manuscripts reveal is the myriad social practices that make up this community. In this paper, I am applying this approach to a single Chan text that has been relatively well studied and translated, the record of the masters and students of Lanka. The text is a translation of the Chinese Lengjie Shi Tzu Ji. Here I'll be using a shortened form of the title, The Masters of Falanka. The text was clearly popular in Dunhuang, as it appears in 13 different Chinese scrolls, and scroll fragments dating from the 9th and 10th centuries, as well as a single Poti manuscript with the Tibetan translation. The Masters of Falanka differs in emphasis from other early Zen lineage texts in its focus on the content of the Master's teachings rather than their life stories. Across the different chapters, there is no single orthodox teaching. Instead, the text brings together trends that were emerging in meditation practice at the time. We cannot be sure whether the works attributed to the individual masters in each chapter really were taught by them, but what we do know is that the selection of meditation practices was circulating in the 9th and 10th centuries. The text begins with a preface by a monk called Jingjue, in which he writes about how he came to be a Buddhist monk and how he achieved a high level of realization thanks to his two meditation teachers. The preface is a patchwork effort which goes back and forth in time, is written partly in the first and partly in the third person, and includes biographical information as well as teachings. Therefore, it is probably not by Jing Jui himself, but put together by his students. After the preface, the Masters of the Lanka goes back to the beginning of the lineage in China, Gunavadra, the Indian Buddhist scholar who traveled to China in the fifth century and worked on the first Chinese translation of the Lankavatara Sutra. The next in the lineage, Bodhidharma, does not meet Gunavadra, but teaches the true spirit of the sutra he translated. The following chapters take one figure in each generation, each carrying forward the lineage of the Lankavatara. After Bodhidharma comes a student, Hui Ke, followed by Seng Chan and Da Xin. After Da Xin comes Huang Ren, who founded the East Mountain teaching tradition. Of his many students, the master of the Lanka focuses on uh, Chen Xiu, who became famous when he favored, was favored by the Empress Wu Zetian. The final part of the text looks briefly at some of Shen Xiu's students, taking us full circle to the generation of Jing Jue, the author of the preface. So how about the physical embodiments of the text? There are several copies of the Chinese texts on scrolls, most of which are now fragmentary. The Masters of the Lanka seems to have been considered important enough to copy onto a scroll on its own, rather than as part of a compendium of texts, as is often the case with Chan literature at Dunhuang. This may be because it was used as a compendium of meditation teachings in itself. However, there's a lot of variation in handwriting, quality of writing, and layouts across the scrolls, which indicates that they were written by individual monks or nuns rather than in a scriptorium. It is possible they were written by students and teachers. This possibility is also just suggested by the Tibetan manuscript version of the Masters of the Langa on the manuscript IOL Tib J710. This is a Poti manuscript in the usual Tibetan style, and in this case, Another text was copied before the Masters of the Lanka. This other Tibetan text is untitled, but addresses teachers and students practicing meditation. The text is linked with early Chan through its espousal of the Tathagata meditation as the supreme meditation practice, a position that is said to have been held by the patriarch Shen Hui. 
The main part of the text has advice for teachers on how to evaluate the abilities of their students. Meditating on the same thing may not be suitable for each and every mind. In their confusion, some people are happy, some wild, some are drowsy, while others are a mixture, says the text. Therefore, the author goes on to say, the meditation teacher should be like a doctor prescribing what works for each individual. Hopefully, these students will eventually reach a point where all techniques are dropped. Though we don't know the author of this text, or whether it was originally written in Tibetan or Chinese, we do know that it was used alongside this Tibetan copy of the Masters of the Lanka. We should consider whether Chinese copies of the Masters of the Lanka were also written down as a resource for meditation teachers and their students. Many of the Chinese copies of the text are quite rough and were probably written in a teaching situation. With this in mind, I think it's worthwhile considering the contents of the Master of the Lanka as an early example of what early teachers and students in Zen lineages were talking about when they discussed and practiced meditation. Also in this educational context, some of the Chan manuscripts may have been copied by students. Looking more closely at the Chan manuscripts in both Chinese and Tibetan, there's a range in the quality of the paper and the handwriting. Some are well and carefully written, while others seem to have been written at speed. The latter may indicate that students were reading and copying certain Chan texts as part of their education. This would fit in with what we know about the Dunhuang manuscripts in general, where many manuscripts have been identified as having been copied by students in an educational setting. This would help us answer another question about the Chan texts from Dunhuang. Who was reading them? The answer is, I think, that they were actually read by very few people. In some cases, if a student's act of copying the text was the key activity, the manuscript itself may not have been read again after it was copied. Some of the larger manuscripts were probably read by those monks whose role was to speak at bodhisattva precept ceremonies and similar events where sermons were required. They may also have read, perhaps by the same people, in more specific teaching contexts for the purpose of instructing individuals in their meditation practice. Thus, the teaching situation between a master and student learning meditation is one of the key social settings in which the manuscripts were created and circulated. Another setting is the much bigger gatherings of people that we know played a major part in the transmission of early Chan lineages in which the precepts of a bodhisattva were conferred on both monastics and lay people. These were known as bodhisattva precept ceremonies or platform ceremonies, as they were often carried out on an ordination platform. The Masters of the Lanka contains in its entirety a sermon for this situation attributed to the patriarch Dao Xin and called Dharma Teachings for the Bodhisattva Precepts. Other Dunhuang manuscripts contain texts for the Bodhisattva Precepts ceremony as well, including the famous Platform Sutra of Huinan and the Platform Sermon of Shen Hui, the latter actually much better represented among the Dunhuang manuscripts. The actual conferring of the precepts, usually 10 in number, was only a minor part of the ceremony, which was mainly a sermon in which extracts from sutras were recited, meditation practices were explained, and the true nature of mind, which is beyond practice, was pointed out to the attending students. When we look among the Tibetan manuscripts from Dunhuang, there are also several that follow the structure of a platform ceremony and probably serve the same purpose, though they do not have that title in making it explicit. The most extensive of these, which I've looked at in detail elsewhere, is the Concertina manuscript Paleo Tibetan 116. Rather than a strict liturgy, this manuscript was more likely used as a source book for various elements of sermon, meditation instruction, and group chanting that would have made up the Bodhisattva precept ceremony. In the Masters of the Lanka, Dauchin's chapter is by far the longest, and the majority is his Dharma teachings for Bodhisattva precepts. In this way, the platform ceremony is also at the center of the Master of the Lanka. Dauchin's platform sermon begins with a teaching on a meditation practice called the Single Practice Concentration. This is a form of meditation that is focused on visualizing a Buddha and reciting their name. Dashan begins his teaching on this practice with a quote from a sutra, and this is the key passage from the sutra describing the actual single practice concentration. Focus your mind on a single Buddha and only recite his name. With an upright posture, facing towards the place where the Buddha resides, stay constantly mindful of this single Buddha. In this state of mind, you will be able to see every Buddha of the past and future clearly manifest. This passage gives us a clear picture of the practice that Daoshin is teaching here. You focus your mind on a Buddha of choice. This would probably involve visualization, a practice that was already well known in China at the time. At the same time, you recite the name of the Buddha over and over again. You sit upright and face towards the direction where the Buddha resides. The pure realms of Buddhas are associated with a particular direction, the most famous being Amitabha's pure land of Sukhavati in the West. Daoshin wants to revise these meditation instructions in his own version of the single practice concentration. For one thing, he sees no reason to face any specific direction. And he says, once you know that mind from the start has never arisen or ceased to be, 
and has always been pure, then you know that it is identical with the pure lands of the Buddhas. So there is no longer any need to face the pure land in the West. That is to say, if the pure land is found in your own mind, it doesn't matter which way you face. On the other hand, Dashin does not apply this to every meditator. It's only for those who have an understanding of the nature of mind. For those people, the key point is that the pure land is present here and now. Though Dashin questions the idea that one has to face the direction of the pure land, he doesn't challenge the basic practice itself, reciting the Buddha's name while visualizing his or her form in one's mind. This practice of mindfulness of the Buddha is nyanfo in Chinese, nembutsu in Japanese. It's a practice that is strongly associated with the pure land schools. This kind of practice actually continued in Zen monasteries in China over the centuries. When people discuss this fact, they usually talk about syncretism and about Zen teachers incorporating popular practices into their tradition. But the Masters of Alanka shows us that as far back as we can go in the surviving sources, Zen meditation teaching include visualizing and reciting the name of the Buddha. To put it another way, nobody combined a pre-existing pure form of Zen meditation with other types of practice like pure land. Zen meditation emerged out of these practices. It's clear that the early teachers and students of these traditions embraced a range of practices, but not all of them were equal. For Daoshin, practicing mindfulness of the Buddha is not an end in itself. The purpose is to get to the point where one is meditating on focusing on nothing at all, the state of mind called mindfulness without an object. When you are mindful of the Buddha, he writes, continuously through every stage of mind, it will simply become clear and calm and mindfulness will no longer be based on perceptual objects. This mindfulness without an object leads to a state of mind free from grasping and dualistic thinking. Daoshin concludes, when you reach this stage, mindfulness of the Buddha fades away as it is no longer needed. So the meditation technique of visualizing a Buddha and reciting the name is to be practiced, but it is also eventually left behind in the realization of non-duality. Daoshin's meditation instructions are among the very earliest instructions in the Chan lineage for sitting in meditation, so it's striking that they begin with this Nyanfo practice. Moreover, it seems to have been popular in other Chan lineages as well. The teaching of the technique of reciting the name of the Buddha and then resting in the nature of mind is seen in another Chan teaching lineage from Dunhuang, the Lidai Fabaoji, record of the jewel of the Dharma through the generations. This text describes the practices associated with the Reverend Kim's Jingzhong lineage, including mass ordinations into the lineage of the Bodhisattva vow performed at night on an ordination platform. Another source on Reverend Kim describes his meditation practice as the recitation of a single character in an increasingly low tone, ending in the silent state of non-thought. The centrality of what we now think of as pure land practice in these Chan rituals reminds us that in early Chan, teachers were not associated with any particular school or practice. They were meditation teachers. This is where it becomes helpful to look beyond Chan manuscripts and along to the wider collection as a whole. Manuscripts containing prayers and mantras in Chinese and Tibetan to Buddhas in their pure lands are quite significant proportion of the Dunhuang manuscripts. In fact, if we include the many copies of the Sutra of Aparamitayas in Tibetan, they number in the thousands. This Sutra promotes a mantra which offers long life and rebirth in the pure land of Amitabha. One particular prayer to Amitabha found in the Tibetan Dunhuang manuscripts was discussed by Jonathan Silk in an article in 1993. The verses of this prayer are punctuated with a Nyanfo style phrase, Amitapu Namo Amitapu. The prayer details the virtues of Amitabha and the qualities of its pure land. It also promises that those who uphold the eight precepts that are associated with the Posada festivals will be reborn in Amitabha's pure land. And the final verses of the prayer indicate that the best way to be reborn in the pure land is to understand that everything, even the Buddhas themselves, are empty. And it says, all phenomena are like an illusion and the illusion itself is empty. If I meditate on this nature of things, I will be reborn in that pure land. Thus, this prayer to Amitabha and others like it among the Dunhuang manuscripts actually follow the same route as Daoshin's platform sermon, starting with a devotion to a Buddha and ending with a recognition that all things, including the Buddhas, are essentially the same in their emptiness. The practice of devotion to a Buddha, such as Amitabha, involves sitting facing the West, chanting, and either visualizing or looking at an image of the deity. The association of this practice with Buddhist festivals, such as the Koshada, suggests that it was often performed in groups. And this may explain why it is the first practice discussed in Daoshin's Bodhisattva Precept Sermon. The public meditation ritual is a starting point for a sermon on meditation that gradually turns the focus inwards to the individual's experience of their own mind. In this way, we can see early Chan meditation is actually emerging from group practice of Nyanfo and Bodhisattva Precept Ceremonies.
another meditation practice in the Masters of the Lanka does something that we usually consider to be the hallmark of tantric or esoteric Buddhism. The meditator imaginatively rec recreates the experience of being a Buddha in their own body and environment. In the Masters of the Lanka, Daoshin teaches a practice in which the meditator performs a classic Buddhist deconstruction of the body into its physical and mental components. The emptiness of the body means that it has no essence, nothing that constitutes me. So when the meditator divides up the body into these different parts, nothing remains but the parts, and all of these parts are impermanent. Then the meditator looks at the body from the point of view of enlightenment, imagining their own bodies empty and clear like a reflection, and endowed with wisdom, which is also like a reflection. This enlightened body, the body of the Buddha, spontaneously responds to the needs of beings without being limited by space. There is a clear parallel here with the tantric practices in which the meditator visualizes their own body as that of a Buddha. The connection is even more clear in the practice that described in Hongwen's chapter of the Masters of the Lanka. It begins with a simple relaxation and visualization practice. When you sit, let your face relax and sit with your head and body straight. Calmly let go of your body and mind. Resting in emptiness, visualize the single syllable. The visualization of the single syllable then expands into a vast and spacious visualization in which the meditator imagines him or herself on top of a mountain. After you have mastered this, when you are sitting, imagine that you are in the green countryside. In the middle, there's, there is a solitary mountain. You are sitting out in the open on top of the mountain, looking in the four directions, seeing far into the distance without barriers or boundaries. As you sit, you feel the whole world, your body and mind free and spacious, abiding in the realm of the Buddhas. The striking visualization creates a sense of spaciousness and clarity, but much more as well. As Hong Wen says, when the meditator is in this imagined state of filling the whole world, they're actually in the realm of the Buddhas. There's an echo of this practice in Hong Wen's last words as recorded in the Masters of the Lanka. The great master then raised his hand and gestured towards the 10 directions, each time stating that the realized mind was already there. This echoes a statement from Daoshan's statement earlier in the Masters of the Lanka that the pure land is simply the mind itself. This is similar to the interpretation of Pure Land practice that we saw in Daoshan's teachings. In addition, Hongwen's pointing to the 10 directions, the eight compass points above and below, might be an allusion to the directional model of the Manda. The link to tantric practice is more evident in Hongwen's instructions to begin the visualization with a single syllable. This is a term most commonly found in tantric literature, occurring in a number of esoteric texts in the Chinese canon. In this esoteric tradition, the syllable that is visualized is usually the syllable A, the first letter of the Sanskrit alphabet, which emerges from the state of emptiness. The single syllable then expands into the whole visualized mandala. The letter R in particular is visualized as a seed syllable from which the Buddha and mandala appears in tantras such as the Mahavairochana, Abhisambodhi Tantra, which with its practices based on the Vajradhatu mandala was hugely influential in Chinese and Tibetan Buddhism from the eighth century onwards. In the tantra, the syllable R is also the seed from which the visualization of the practitioner's own body as the Buddha appears. Among the Dunhuang manuscripts, this is seen in the ritual manuals of the tradition of Anoga Vajra mm. and his students, such as Pelio Shinwa's 3913. It is also found across the Tibetan tantric manuscripts from Dunhuang in both the Yoga Tantra texts, which overlap with those of Anoga Vajra's lineage, and the Mahayoga texts that were mainly transmitted in Tibetan rather than Chinese. There is plenty of further evidence in the Dunhuang manuscripts that these practices were not considered distinct from those we call Chan. In the above Tibetan manuscripts, we see in these Tibetan manuscripts, we see the practice of observing the mind employed in Mahayoga deity visualization practice and tantric concepts invoked in Chan Tibetan lineages. Likewise, some of the Chinese tantric practices from Dunhuang include a formless worship with clear overlaps with the textual genre we call Chan. Among the Chinese manuscripts, there are a number in which the lineage of teachers usually associated with the transmission of Chan are associated with tantric ritual and meditation practices. These include a major compendium in the ritual tradition of the Moga Vajra called the Vajra Peak Scripture, in which the Chan lineage begins with the deity Mahavairochana, and each member through to Huinan is said to have entered the Vajra Dhatu Mandal. We can't say whether the visualization of a single syllable and pure realm was actually taught by Hong Ren. What we can say is that the compilers of the Masters of the Lanka and those who based their teaching on it considered this to be an absolutely mainstream practice for their lineage of meditation teaching. This is important to keep in mind when we look at other practices where the tantric texts sit side by side with Chan texts. The practices in the Hong Ren chapter of the Masters of the Lanka 
may not be tantric or esoteric per se. And I won't delve into that discussion here. But we can understand why contemporary practitioners, practitioners might not have seen the great distinction between the meditation teachings of Chan lineages and those of tantric or esoteric teaching lineages. The Vajra Peak scripture mentioned above includes Hongwen, among those said to have entered the Vajra Datu Mandala. As with the Pure Land practices, we should also consider the local social context of Denhuang by taking the manuscript collection as a whole. Chan texts were copied alongside tantric texts, but it is equally significant that manuscripts with Chan texts were part of a wider collection that includes many more tantric ritual texts than Chan texts. In other words, from the manuscripts themselves, there is every sign that those who practice meditation in the Chan tradition were at least very aware of are more likely involved with the mainstream tantric practices of the time as well. Neither the teachers represented in the Masters of the Lanka, nor those who circulated it, saw themselves as following a particular kind of Buddhism called Chan or Zen. Rather, they saw themselves as belonging to a specific lineage of teachers who specialized in meditation. We see the same picture in the Tibetan manuscripts from Dunhuang. It is perhaps easier to understand these Chan texts as just one genre of meditation teaching among many, because they never developed into a distinct school in Tibet. But in both Chinese and Tibetan language materials from the 9th and 10th centuries in Dunhuang, Practices were not associated with schools and separated by sectarian concerns, and Buddhist practitioners, practitioners were not limited by categories such as Chan Buddhism because they did not exist at the time. Thank you.